This video is about oligopoly market structures, looking at the conduct of firms, the kink demand curve, and the outcomes of this particular market structure for consumers and firms. Oligopoly is a market structure where there are a small number of large firms operating in that market. So there's high market concentration, maybe three, four or five really big firms control the majority of the market share in these markets. And those firms are going to produce highly differentiated products. And this is actually one of the main ways that firms in oligopoly markets compete with each other is to create these differentiated offerings for customers from their rivals to attract more customers and more market share. It's very, very difficult in oligopoly for new firms to move into the market because of these high barriers to entry and exit. And so this might include economies of scale, which are the benefits that these large incumbent firms have in terms of their cost per unit. It might include sunk costs, which are costs which can't be recovered if you leave the market. And that actually makes the cost of failure really high and discourages new firms from taking a risk and entering the market. It uh, could also include legal barriers, which are when large firms protect their dominance using things like patents, which can stop new rivals from being able to compete with them. And also a, a range of different marketing barriers as well, which can create brand loyalty and give that advantage to firms who are already in the market to potential firms who are looking to move into that market. Now, there are also there's also imperfect knowledge and information in this market structure, which means it's not necessarily easy for customers to immediately make comparisons between different firms and what they're offering. And part of the reason for that is actually the lack of homogeneity between the products in that market. So going back to that point about the differentiated products, and that means that any price differentials are not always obvious to customers and makes it more difficult for them to make those comparisons. And finally, we've got firms as price makers, which means they have the power to set their own prices. Although, as we'll see, there is often a lot of interdependence between firms as well on how they take these decisions. Now, there are a number of really important and quite technical terms which describe the range of conduct of firms in oligopoly markets. And probably the most significant of these is collusion, which is when firms work together to try and reduce the level of competition in the market. Because intense competition between firms in oligopoly markets is very likely to reduce profits for all of them, and it's not going to be very desirable for the firms. And so this is why they're much more likely in a lot of situations to try and work together. But that's not necessarily going to be the case in all situations. So we could also have oligopolies that would be non-collusive for a number of reasons, really, but not least because there's regulation controlling collusion and it could lead to a hefty fine from the Competition and Markets Authority if levels of collusion uh, can be proved. Which is why actually sometimes firms in oligopoly markets collude tacitly which means they don't have any formal agreements in place, which could lead to fines. A classic example of this would be all firms keeping prices really quite high. There's no agreement made between them, but each one knows pretty much what they're doing and how it's going to benefit all of the firms in that particular market. Now, if formal collusion happens consistently with businesses working together over a period of time, it's called a cartel. And these are generally illegal in most countries now to protect the interests of consumers. It's also important not to confuse collusion with cooperation because collusion has that express purpose of reducing competition in the market. But cooperation might actually include agreements on sharing research and development or innovative practices, which could actually come at the benefit of consumers as well. So then building what we said, building on what we said about collusion and tacit collusion, a big part of oligopoly markets is about setting price and how this is actually done. So we might have price leadership, which is where a very dominant firm would set the prices and then other, others would follow and generally fall into line behind them. We might have price agreements, 
uh, which would be where firms actually agree between them on the setting of price. And this is probably the one that would be most likely to lead to censure from the Competition and Markets Authority again. Or we could have price wars, which would be when firms compete and undercut each other to try and gain customers and market share off each other. And generally, firms in oligopoly markets want to avoid this at all costs which is why more commonly they actually compete through non-price competition. So instead of undercutting a rival on price, they might make improvements to their product or they might make better customer service offerings or design adverts to attract more customers in that way instead. One of the key features of oligopoly markets is interdependence between firms. So that means that if one firm changes their behavior and does something something different, it's likely to have a very big impact on the other firms who are operating in that market. And the outcome of this is that we have this model and this diagram of the kink demand curve. So with the kink demand curve, the oligopolist firm is initially charging price P at this point, and then the demand curve, their average revenue curve, kinks around that price point. So you get a more shallow curve above that price point for price increases and a steeper curve for prices below that price point for price decreases. So let's just investigate now why that's likely to be the case. So demand is likely to be priced inelastic in response to price falls for that oligopolist firm. The oligopolist tries to decrease their prices. And the reason for that is because if they try and cut their prices, all of their rivals, the three, four, five, six other firms who are operating in that oligopoly market are not going to want to lose market share to them. So they are all going to cut their prices as well. And if all of those firms cut their prices together, that oligopolist firm who's cut their prices initially is not going to find a big increase in the quantity they're going to be able to sell because all of the customers possible options are all cutting their prices at the same time. And so for that reason, demand is likely to be priced inelastic for those price cuts because that's what we mean by inelastic demand. The price falls, it doesn't have a very big impact on quantity demanded because all of the other firms in the oligopoly are cutting their prices as well. So you get the price inelastic demand curve, which has a relatively steep slope. What about if the oligopolist was to increase their prices? Well, in that case, they would find demand relatively price elastic because they decide to increase their prices. All of those rivals are going to sit back and watch them lose customers just by keeping prices the same because those customers are then going to think they've got three, four, five other options. They can go and buy their products from the other oligopoly firms rather than that oligopolist who has just tried to increase their prices. And so that's why we have that price elastic demand, which means that the increase in price has a big impact on quantity demanded because consumers are going to the other rivals instead. Now, the really, really important outcome of this is that the model suggests there is likely to be price rigidity in oligopoly markets. So prices aren't going to change very much and very often. And let's just look in a little bit more detail exactly why that's the case. So we've got our average revenue curve, which we've said kinks around that price point, and the marginal revenue curve is twice the steepness of the average revenue curve, as you can see there. When that average revenue curve kinks, the marginal revenue curve actually goes vertical and slumps further down and continues at a sleep, steeper slope further down. So remember that when we're looking at the profit maximizing output for the oligopoly firm, that's going to be at the point where marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. And I've actually drawn two different marginal cost curves on here to show that that marginal cost could shift to any place in between these two marginal cost curves. And that profit maximizing point would be at exactly the same level. And so it wouldn't have any impact on price, no matter the shift in the marginal cost curve between these two marginal cost curves that I've got drawn on here. 
So that means that the cost conditions can change much more significantly in oligopoly than in other market structures without price being impacted. And there you have that price rigidity. Now, it is worth adding that you could add the average cost curve onto here as well. And then you could show super normal profits uh, are possible for the oligopolist. But the main point really of the kink demand curve diagram is to show that outcome in terms of price rigidity um, in, and that really important outcome of oligopoly markets. So the last thing to do here on oligopoly markets is to evaluate. And to do that, we need to look at the advantages, the disadvantages and weigh them up to start to make some informed judgments on the outcomes of this particular market structure. So in terms of the advantages first, we've seen that supernormal profits are available in oligopoly markets. And these supernormal profits can then be spent on research and development and boosting dynamic efficiency. So dynamic efficiency is about these improvements to efficiency which happen over time. And that's really unlikely to be possible without these supernormal profits to fund that investment and gain these improvements. Now, remember, in oligopoly, we've got big firms, a small number of large firms, and that large scale of production for the individual firms means they're very likely to benefit from internal economies of scale. So these are reductions in cost per unit that come from growth and increasing scale of production for those individual firms. And then consumers can potentially benefit from that in terms of possibly lower prices as well if they are passed on. Another advantage of oligopoly is that we get product differentiation, which increases consumer choice. So one of the main ways that firms compete in oligopoly markets is to differentiate, to try and stand out. And so this then gives consumers a wide range of different products to choose from in this market structure. And finally, on the advantages, it's relatively easy for consumers to make comparisons on price and quality between the smaller number of firms that exist in oligopoly markets. So you've only got a handful of firms. So it's much easier for consumers um, who are buying products in that market structure to make those comparisons and to make decisions than if there were hundreds of firms all in competition with each other. So in terms of the disadvantages now, and the first one might sound a little bit contradictory because we've just said that product differentiation increases consumer choice. But what we might find is that while there's more choice between differentiated products, there's actually less choice between firms. So remember the number of firms in oligopoly is relatively small. So consumers don't have a lot of different options if they decide they don't want to buy products from one particular firm anymore. The supernormal profits that are earned in oligopoly and the high prices mean that prices above marginal cost. And so we do not get allocative efficiency in oligopoly markets. So remember that allocative efficiency is achieved where price is equal to marginal cost. In the kink demand curve diagram, we can see that price is above marginal cost. So allocative efficiency is not achieved. And then we've got this expenditure on marketing that oligopolists are likely to undertake is going to mean that that um, their costs are likely to be higher and that potentially could be passed on to the consumer in the form of higher prices. So actually the main ways that, firm compete, that firms in oligopoly markets compete is to avoid price wars and maybe compete using marketing, advertising instead. If you think about it, consumers aren't really gaining any benefit from seeing those adverts. It's just for the oligopolist to try and get more consumers to them ahead of their rivals. So the expenditure from the consumer's point of view is actually a bit worthless and might mean they end up paying higher prices to cover those costs as well. Now, a really great phrase to use when you're finishing up on your evaluation is to say, what this might depend on. So you can say a couple of points here, there's a huge range of different things you could mention in talking about uh, the impact and evaluating the impact of oligopoly, but you could say the outcome and the impact would depend on how these supernormal profits are spent, how they are allocated. So if they're spent, as we said on the advantages on research and development and making those improvements and gaining dynamic efficiency, then 
yeah, the advantages of oligopoly very likely might outweigh the disadvantages. But if those supernormal profits are just spent on dividends for shareholders, then it's likely that the disadvantages might start to outweigh the advantages. You could also talk about how it would depend on the conduct of those firms in the oligopoly. There's a lot of collusion between the firms and the prices are kept really high, then consumers certainly are likely to lose out. Whereas if you've got a non-collusive, more competitive oligopoly market, then again, we might start to see some of those benefits outweighing the costs, particularly for consumers.